one of the things I've noticed time and time again is that whenever I talk about the relationship between responsibility and meaning, the crowds that I'm talking to go silent. Say, look, you need a meaning to sustain you through the vicissitudes of life. Okay, well, try to debate that. It's like, is life painful? Yes. Is it anxiety provoking? Yes. Is it uncertain? Yes. Is it painful beyond bearing sometimes? Yes, it's difficult. Everyone agrees about that. Now, they might disagree about how difficult, but that doesn't matter. That The central point holds. Okay, what if you think that's all pointless? Well, that doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, so you need a sustaining meaning. Well, where do you find that? Well, you generally find it in responsibility to yourself and to other people. And people ask themselves those questions when, when I'm talking, because I ask them to ask themselves those questions, and that's the answer. Well, what's meaningful? Well, I have a meaningful relationship with my father. I have a meaningful relationship with my wife. I have a meaningful relationship with my pet, you know, because I take care of that pet. Um, when I commit to something and make sacrifices, that sacrifice is something I also talk about a lot in both of the last two books. You know, if something's valuable, you'll make sacrifices to attain it. That that discovery of sacrifice, I think that's what separates human. It's one of the primary factors separating human beings from animals. Because we discovered that we could let go of something we value in the present and we would gain something we value even more in the future. We acted that out dramatically in all sorts of strange ways over thousands and thousands of years before it was formalizable psychologically. But it's a massive discovery. I can forego gratification in a particular way and benefit in the future. So I can share the proceeds of my hunt and I store up future food in the form of reputation and the favors I've owed, I'm owed now by other people. It's a massive discovery. It took me a long time to understand that belief regulated emotion. So what happens is that if you act out your identity, if you act out your beliefs in the world and what you want doesn't happen, what happens is that your body defaults into emergency preparation for action. And the reason for that is you've wandered too far away from the campfire and now you're in the forest and maybe you're naked. And so what do you do then? And the answer is, well, you don't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't want, know what to do? And the answer is you prepare to do everything. And the problem with that is that it's unbelievably draining psychophysiologically, like it hurts you. And there, there's, there's an immense physiological literature detailing the, the cost of, of, of exactly that kind of response. People stay where what they do has the results they want. That's partly why you want to be around people who share your cultural presuppositions is because you know that, for example, even in small ways, let's say you're a country music aficionado and you're hanging around with your cowboy hatted buddies and you throw on a tape and everyone says great tunes, man. And you, you know, you're happy about that. But, you know, you throw on a piece by Tchaikovsky and you're you're in a different subculture. And who the hell are you? And people, the people in your group will say, man, who listens to music like that? And like, that's a trivial example in some sense, but I, I believe it's one that everyone can resonate to. We like, we, it's very hard on us not to be where we know what, we know that what we want is going to happen. We hate that. We hate that and no wonder. So, and then, you know, there are, there are varying degrees of that, obviously. You can really be where you don't know what's going to happen, or you can only be there to some degree. But by and large, by and large, we're conservative creatures, even if we're liberal in temperament. There's not, we can't tolerate that much uncertainty. And there, you might ask, well, why? And the answer is, well, because you can be hurt, pain, you can be damaged, you can become intolerably anxious, and you can die. So it's no wonder you're sensitive. We're very sensitive to negative emotion. And so our identities, re functional identity regulates your emotion. But you do that in concert with other people. In the first chapter of the new book, Beyond Order, the rule is uh, don't casually denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. That's that balance again. 
Um, I make the case that most of your sanity is socially distributed. And what I mean by that is, well, let's say that you know how to behave. You're well socialized. You can play with others. Now, I said already in this conversation, if you didn't learn to play with others between the time you were two and four, you will never learn. And psychologists have beat their heads against the wall trying to rehabilitate antisocial children. They can't do it after the age of four. Well, it seems to be partly because the kids fall farther and farther behind. So let's say you make the leap from egocentric dependence on your mother at two and three to immersion in a peer group. Well, then, the, then you, you pick peers that are at your same developmental level and you chase each other up the developmental ladder. And the longer you're out of that, the farther you fall behind. And so, you know, kids, five-year-old kids might come across another five-year-old kid who tends to cry too much if they don't get their way. And they'll say, we don't want to play with the baby. And what they're saying is, we have to find someone who's at our developmental level, shares our developmental horizon so that we can mutually scaffold our further development. Now, they're not going to say that, obviously, but that's the situation. And kids test each other out when they first meet. So do adults. Game, 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 game. Can you play? Are you playing at the same level as me? I'm playing my game at the level that will further my development. Can you play along with me? If not, well, maybe you're lower in status and I can pull you up as a mentor. Maybe you're higher in status and I can learn from you. But if you're a peer, we can play together. Anyways, if you're acceptable to your peers and you behave well, they'll accept you. And then they tell you all the time if you're acting appropriately. You know, if your jokes are funny, if you're dominating the conversation, if you're bringing something of value to the table. And all you have to do is pay attention to the social cues and you'll keep yourself regulated. Do not allow yourself to become arrogant, deceitful, or resentful. I might have the order wrong there, but that's the chapter. Yeah, it opens with a discussion of why you would get resentful. It's like, well, culture is arrayed against you, so you're the target of tyrannical forces that are beyond your control. They're arbitrary. They don't work in your interest, at least not entirely. And the more eccentric you are, let's say, the more tyrannical culture will be to you. And so you're stuck with that. And then nature conspires to destroy you constantly and is going to do that with pain and anxiety and aging. And then there's the uncontrollability and darkness of your own psyche. And everyone faces those. Now, we face the positive elements of those too, the beneficence of culture, the beauty of nature, the glory of the human spirit. That's there as well. You have reasons to be deceitful, resentful, and arrogant, but it's not a good game unless you want to produce hell. You know, I took the idea that we were supposed to learn something from the horrors of the Second World War seriously. Never forget, okay? You can't remember what you don't understand. So what are we supposed to remember? What are we remembering? The fact that all these people were murdered? No, we're supposed to remember that that was a revelation of the genocidal nature of the human psyche. That's partly why I'm so impressed, let's say, with the story of Cain and Abel. I, I dealt with that in my biblical lecture series and in my writings. You know, the first two human beings, according to the book upon which our culture is predicated for better or worse, the first two human beings, brothers, the adversary and the hero, the the archetypal adversary and the hero put right at the beginning of that amazing book. It's the beginning of history. Cain's sacrifices are rejected by God. Okay, well, how do we understand that? That's easy. Once you know the key, you make sacrifices to make the future better. Well, what if that doesn't pay off? Well, you know, think about that. You know what that's like. You endeavor to do something and it doesn't work. You're not appreciated for who you are. You fail. Maybe you fail despite your best efforts. Well, are you rejected by God? Well, it's as if you're rejected by God. Does it make you resentful? Does it make you bitter? Does it make you want to pull down the successful? 
Does it want it? Does it make you want to pull down the successful out of spite? Does it make you want to pull down the successful out of cosmic spite? The answer to that happens to be yes. You shake your fist at God. You say, oh, I'm going to harm those whom you blessed. And no wonder. It's no wonder. You know, it's a, it's harsh that the rewards of life are indiscriminately distributed. It's hard on everyone. But it doesn't help. It doesn't help to become bitter. And it's not like I don't understand the temptation. I mean, I think part of the reason I get away with being so bloody preachy is because I'm talking to myself. You know, it's not like I don't put myself in the boat of the damned and lost. We have to strive not to be wretched. There's something that doesn't seem fair about that. Why couldn't we just be happy being who and what we are? Why is it that we're punished if we don't strive? Well, I don't know. I'm, we're negentropic organisms, right? I mean, we have to maintain this incredible complexity in the face of a dissipating universe. It requires effort. It's the, it's the, it's the second law of thermodynamics, I believe. That's why we have to strive. Well, why is the world constituted that way? Couldn't, I guess it's an infantile paradisal wish in some regard. Couldn't we just be rewarded for who we are? I can understand that. But I don't think that it works. I don't think that's how things, I don't think things function like that. And I don't think probably in the final analysis we really want them to. I don't know if anyone enjoys undeserved reward. You know, it, it feels kind of creepy. Doesn't it, to be rewarded for something you didn't do? The positive emotion that we find sustaining is experienced in relationship to an unachieved goal. It's hope that drives us forward. We want something, and if we see ourselves moving towards that, then we're, we're in the grip of the positive emotion that we find sustaining. It isn't the attainment. Attainment is satiating. Attainment shuts down the system that has been striving for that particular object of attainment. If you're hungry and you eat, you stop being hungry. Now, that's good because the hunger is gone, but that whole frame disappears. You can no longer strive within that frame, and you need a new frame to strive towards. And so technically, and this is well established as far as I'm concerned, we even know the drugs that people abuse, cocaine, let's say amphetamines, the ones that are potent sources of positive emotion, activate the system that regulates our emotional response to evidence that we're moving towards a desired goal. So cocaine, for example, is an exhilarating drug. It makes you feel that things are worthwhile because it hijacks the system that does make indicate that things are worthwhile. So this is deeply, this, this striving aspect is deeply rooted in, in, our, in, our, in our biology mm. for, for obvious reasons. Pick something. Aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay. But at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. The best we have might not always work. But it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away.